fire. <laughs> So I, um, uh, you know, like we need the fuel, right? And the Holy Spirit is the fuel. So I went, and usually what I do, uh, because in Isaiah 28, he's talking about the, in the stammering lips, I talk and to people, it's talking about the speaking in tongues. And it says it's a place of rest and refreshing. So that's why every time I feel tired, for me, not for Masood. I don't think it's for Masood. Uh, he has another way of uh, refreshing himself. He doesn't speak in tongues, but he uh, focuses on, you know, you need to, we need to find our way of refueling. So I started speaking in tongues, and when I speak in tongues, that's, for me, it's the immediate release of life into my, my body. And I shook myself off, and I said, I'm not tired. So, <laughs> so and, uh, and, and when I came, I just felt like, um, you know, we just need to break this because uh, the walking with the spirit of God is walking with the voice of God. So, and what do, we, what do I mean to walk with the voice of God? That means we are constantly hearing different voices. And the, which one do we believe becomes our reality? Right? And, and that's why, you know, we don't have to jump and start with something big. When we, want to talk, when we want to walk in the spirit, we can start with the small things. And maybe we can do it one and then miss the two, the next two, and then we, and as we move on, we get stronger in walking in the spirit. I remember one time I was, uh, <clears throat> I was really feeling this offense toward this person. And, and I'm not that person. In the last eight years, since the day Masudana we became a Christian, we have never been offended at anyone because that's the fruit of the flesh because you see something from in someone in the flesh and not considering anything in the spirit and then you get offended because you have the unseen laws that you have put for yourself that no one knows about it and when someone passed that line that you put there then you get offended that shows you're walking in the flesh because you have laws <laughs> and nobody knows these laws. This is something that you put and you said, this is who I am. And when someone comes and um, acts the way to you that is against who you are according to your own law, and then you get offended. Yeah. So Masood and I, we, we, when we came to Christ, we realized that the offense is the root of death. Yeah. Oh. Adam and Eve in Genesis, when they... Uh, when God told them that, you know, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and, and, and you'll die, uh, they got offended. When serpent came and serpent says, no, God knows that if you eat of it, you shall be like God. That means God knows that if you eat, you shall be like God and he doesn't want you to be like God. So, so the offense is the root of death. And um, Cain was offended at his brother, and then offended at God, and offended, and offended, and offended. So that's why, um, that's why I'm not that kind of person. So one day I'm just like feeling this offense toward this person, and I can't get rid of it. And at the same time, I was sick, and uh, I just feeling sick like this in my stomach. I was really sick. And I was like, okay, so I need to get rid of this feeling. Not knowing that you don't have to get rid of any feeling. <laughs> because the feeling is a lie. <laughs> Who I am is the most important thing. I remember Masood was uh, telling me for so long time, you know, Rose, you don't have to come into the spirit. You are in the spirit. Yes. 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 You may feel the flesh, but don't believe that you are in it. We don't jump from here and there and, uh, the, okay, I'm in the spirit, now I'm in the flesh. No, you are in the spirit. Do you want the verse? To sh do you want me to show you the verse? <laughs> Let me finish the story and I'll show you the verse. 
<laughs> so when Masood was talking about it, I was like, yeah, 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 jumping up and down. And that was just a revelation for me until that day. So I'm just trying to get rid of this feeling. So I'm worshiping. Ooh, Jesus. And the Lord says, what are you doing? I'm the like, Lord, I'm worshiping you. And he said, no, you're trying to get rid of your feeling. <laughs> I was like, oh. So... Anyways, I went to I went to room to the, to my room and I said well, I need to deal with this thing because I'm feeling sick and all this stuff. So I went to the room and um, and so I I just knelt down and I said, Oh Jesus! And I was hearing at least ten different voices. One voice was telling me, Okay, why don't you get up and worship? Another voice was telling me, oh, you don't need to get up and worship. Why don't you just close your eyes and pray? Another voice was telling me, oh, you don't need to close your eyes and pray. You know, why don't you just quote a scripture and keep reminding yourself? Those are good voices, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So one voice, was, one voice was saying that, you know, just, just be still and just quiet. Another voice was telling me, no, what does it mean? Shake the dust off of yourself and get up and start jumping up and down and get rid of this thing. And I'm sitting and I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay, okay, which one of those voices I gotta believe now? And do you see that there are like sheep and the, there are wolves in the sheep clothes? Yes. I was hearing a scriptures. When Jesus was in the wilderness, Satan told, the devil told him, it is written, throw yourself down. And it is written that God will send the angels and you shall not dash your foot. I, I, I was in that situation. And, and I think we are all, every day we are in that situation. The most powerful weapon for the carnal mind is the scripture. Is the voice of God. In Genesis, when Ad, when serpent showed up, the conversation it wasn't about the gay and lesbians. The conversation wasn't about the alcoholic. There was a conversation happening about God. About what just God spoke. It was about God that serpent showed up. Serpent would never show up if God doesn't speak. Yeah. Temptation. Temptation comes when the truth is spoken. Every time that God speaks, another voice comes. Every single time. The temptation doesn't come if the God doesn't speak because there is nothing there to come against it. So, so anyways, I went to the... And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I'm just tired of this. I don't know what to do. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard this small, still voice inside of me. I love you. I was like, you know what? I got up and I said, I don't need to get rid of my feelings. I am not in the flesh. I am a spirit. I'm not going to pray to get rid of my feeling. I'm not going to worship to get rid of it because that's not who I am. I am the live son of the living God. This is who I am. And I don't, I'm not in the flesh. I don't feel offense. I love my friend. Da, 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 da. So I went, when I closed the door, I felt 10 times worse. <laughs> I really want to tell you I felt good, but I didn't. So I closed the door, I banged the door. I was angry at myself and all those voices <laughs> that is speaking at the corner of mine. So, so what I did, I just like, so I'm feeling. So Masood was in bed and I was like, I'm walking, I'm going toward the bed to sleep. And I, every step, it was worse. I could feel, I want to kill this person, you know, yeah, and I was feeling even worse, and I'm like, ignoring, because that's not who I am. Why do I need to even pay attention to this? But I can't deny the feeling was real. It was real, I can't deny it. So anyways, I went to bed, and 
And I just closed my eyes and I started talking to the father. And I, thought, I started talking about the beast and about the, I don't know, book of Revelation or whatever the scripture was in my mind. I started talking about, about him. And all of a sudden, a hand came, went right into my belly, pulled me out. I was this much off the uh, uh, mattress, came down, and this thing left. I don't know what was that. I don't know what happened. But I saw this hand came. And it was amazing because I went up and woof, came back. And immediately, every feeling that I had, it was gone. <laughs> but guess what? If that would have not happened, I would have still continued in what I believe, who I am. I wasn't even thinking about this would happen or not. That could happen for months. Right? So let's go to Romans so I can show you the verse. So you know that you are in the spirit and you don't have to try to come out of the flesh. Well, we were talking about the woman. I don't know how am I tie that one to that one. But, uh, well, Lord help. <laughs> okay. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. You know, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says that the scriptures are written for your admonishing and for to give you wisdom that you can inherit salvation. When you go back to the story of Solomon, it says Solomon, God gave Solomon wisdom. And his wisdom was in a place that in all his kingdom, there was not any evil. The gold was like dust. There was nothing evil in his kingdom. And what does it say? It says, it's the wisdom of God that will give you discernment so the evil cannot be activated. So evil cannot be active in the presence of the wisdom of God. That's why Jesus is sitting and all of a sudden he turns to someone in the crowd and says, why are you thinking evil in your heart? Why are you thinking evil? Because it's the wisdom of God. And so what do we need to discern between seven voices that all are good? Worshipping is good, praying is good, uh, jumping up and down is good, shaking yourself off of the dust is good, going to church is good, but there are some, they could be wolves and sheep. But that's the wisdom of the living God that helps you to hear the voice of the living God. And Jesus said, if you are my sheep, you will hear my voice and you will follow my voice. So, so that's why when we read the scripture, it's walking in this path that we are talking about. Um, it eventually comes through the wisdom of God. And every scripture that we are learning and everything that we are learning, it is leading us to a wisdom that we are become mature and we know how to deal every situation. And we can discern which one is the truth and which one is not. That's the whole story of the truth. Because law can become reality. So yesterday we were talking about, uh, Pastor Wynn was talking about the light and darkness, that darkness is just illusion. It doesn't exist, but it can become reality. Yeah. That's true. Jesus said, I am the truth, and he went around healing everyone. Healing is the truth, and sickness is a lie. That's right. yeah. and that's what, but we experience sickness, yeah. but that means we're experiencing something that is not the truth, that doesn't exist. But we are feeling it. We are ex that's why when you bring the light, darkness goes. When we say that it's illusion, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We created them through the, the heart of unbelief that we had to the point that uh, Genesis says, man become uh, the inventors of evil. Do you think evil is really smart? <laughs> Masood and I, we were talking yesterday, and probably Masood is going to, going to touch on it, and I don't want to go that way. Masood said, 
Everybody says, even the, the devil is talking to me. We were just talking together. So and so in Iran, devil is talking. In Canada, devil is talking. And there is devil is talking. America, devil is talking. California, devil is talking. It sounds like if devil is the, this entity, you know, it sounds like devil is the omnipresent. Yeah. Yeah. Like God. <laughs> we made it to the level of God and we are comparing devil with God. God is the only omnipresent in every situation. He's the one is inside every single person. And he's the one is outside of every single person. He's the one that is above us, below us, right, left, before us, behind us. He's the omnipresent, not the devil. It's your carnal mind. It's the mind of Adam. I was reading about second death, which I'm going to talk today about it, hopefully. Um, in, um, in, Reve- in end of Revelation, and it says the cowardly, Pastor Wynn talked about it, cowardly, unbelieving um, murderers, they go to the lake of fire, and I'm thinking, who was the coward? Adam. Who was a murderer? Adam. Who was unbelieving? Adam. <sighs> Adam, who disobeyed God and the voice of God, who didn't believe God, who Adam is criminal. That's why he had to be on the cross and get crucified. They would crucify the criminals. When Jesus was on the cross, he was us on the cross, putting an end to a, to a criminal and bring a new man out of us. So let's look at uh, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The word to those who are it does not exist in the original language. Cross it off. It's, and it says, therefore, now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Not for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's a big difference. You can be in Christ Jesus and be in condemnation. Because you are the one in Christ Jesus. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. And when we move forward, it tells us, now you are in Christ Jesus. Why are you condemned? Why are you condemned? Because you are the Christ. And there is no condemnation in him. So, for the law... And says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Who doesn't walk according to flesh, but according to the spirit? The Christ Jesus. The Christ Jesus doesn't bring any condemnation on anyone because he's not the one who walks according to flesh. So do you see condemnation is according to flesh? Do you see if you feel condemnation, it's the work of the flesh in you? Right? Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Do you see that the condemnation brings sin, is a sin, and it brings death because it's a law. So when you are in the spirit, there is a new law, and that's the law of the spirit of life. When you are in the flesh, there are two law works together, sin and death, producing condemnation and death at the end. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. 
All right? So I don't have time to go through this because I want to get to the, to the main point here. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that means if we walk according to the spirit, we are walking according to the law of the spirit of life. Okay? That's why life can be fulfilled. All right, so look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Do you, the word mind there, it should be the word thought. This is what it says. This, if Look at verse, the next verse, and it completes that. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and death. So one time, life and peace. One time the Lord told me, like, what is death? We need to find a definition for death. The definition that the world has given us for death is when someone dies and we bury that person. But what is the definition of the Bible for the word death? It says the carnal thoughts. The thoughts that is according to the law of sin and flesh. The thoughts that is according to flesh is death. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Eventually you see it fulfilled in the body, but there is a thought that is death. Yes. Yes. So if you want to live in life, you need to have thoughts of the law of the spirit of life. Right? If you want to live in life, you need to change your thoughts. Because the thoughts of the flesh is death, but the thoughts of the spirit is life. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. What is the law of God? The law of the spirit of life. We read that in Psalms, blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. Which law? The law of the spirit of life, the law of a spirit. It says, the carnal mind is a, an enemy toward God. So when we were enemies to him in our mind, he died for us so that we can see and have the thoughts of the spirit and realize that we don't, we, he has never been our enemy. I thought with the thoughts of mind, because when the serpent came to me in, 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 uh, in the, my garden, and serpent made God my enemy, God knows, and he doesn't want you to have this. If, do you know, do you know the works of the law is dead? Which law? Not the law of God. Do you know when you say, if I do this, then I can have that, you are saying God is a liar? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you say that, okay, you know, I got to do something to get rid of this feeling that I have, you are saying... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are saying... <clears throat> All right, so now look at verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. How do you please God? When you think a spirit. When you have the thoughts of life, when you have the thought of the spirit, you please God. Do you know what does it mean? The moment you feel condemned and you believe you're condemned, you're walking in death, and God is not pleased because death is not your destiny. Death is not who you are. Life is. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Life is. Yes. That's why he portrayed something on the cross. And Jesus went on the cross not because God was angry at man and wanted to pour out his wrath on someone. Because man was angry at God and poured his wrath on him on the cross. The cross of Jesus is not that the God was angry at man. 
We, we killed him. Peter starts saying, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. Yes. The cross is the wrath of man on God. When Jesus is on the cross, he's representing this carnal man and the brother that killed the brother because the brother was mad at God. Cain killed Abel. Yes. And Jesus cries out and he says, why have you forsaken me? It was the cry of the heart of Adam, man, the carnal man on the cross that said, God, you forsaken me. Yes. Yes. And then a few hours later, he said, Father, I give my spirit into your hand. He told his disciples that you leave me alone, but I'm not alone. My father is with me. He's on the cross and he says, I, come, I give my spirit into you because you have always been with me. I never thought the way Adam thought. I am the son of God. I believe what you say who I am. Man, when, he, when Jesus cried out on the cross and said, why have you forsaken me? It was Adam who thought all his life for the father God had forsaken him. Yeah. Uh. So now he brings that uh, um, into the picture so that we realize we pour out his wrath on him. So that we realize that God has never, ever been mad at any man at any time. Because he, because he had passed, he, he had what is the word? <laughs> passed over. Because he had passed over our sin, he came. Yes. Wow. Because he had never been angry at man at any time. No. So why are we thinking he's angry today at anyone? No. It is the serpent that has exalted itself above the knowledge of Christ, makes itself God. So look at verse Look at verse 8 one more time. Then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But it's a big but. If you want to circle this but, circle this but here and every time you think you are in a flesh, come to this but here. Yes, yes. Right? But you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. Yes. Thank God for that. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. But in the spirit, if. Fire. Circle. If. Yes. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. That means if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you are not the Christ. You are not in the Christ. So you are subject to the law of sin and death. Yes. So you are under the condemnation of the flesh. Yes. But if you have the spirit of God, guess what? You are not in the flesh. So we shouldn't go around and saying, oh, you know, I was in the flesh flesh and then I came back to the spirit now I'm in the flesh again and then I'm back to the spirit no you're not you might feel the flesh but that's not who you are who told you you are in the flesh who told you you have the ability to fall into the flesh who told you you have the ability to be to, to have unbelief Oh, you know, I guess I didn't believe enough. Who told you that? Wow. Wow. Let's go to James chapter 1. Every morning, um, I used to get up early in the morning because I was, we were working a uh, long time. And, <clears throat> and I, I had to spend time with Jesus before I go to work. So I had 
I, I would write down some verses that would just wake me up um, so that I realize that what I'm doing, I'm not reading the Bible to fix my life. I'm not reading the Bible to teach. I'm not reading the Bible to um, get anything out of it so I can have a better life. I read the Bible because I want to know who he is and who I am in him. Amen. Period. Amen. I don't worship to get rid of my feelings. I worship because I am in awe of who he is. Amen. For a month, the Lord told me, don't worship. Mm, don't. don't. And I'm like, why not? He said, because every time you're, going, you're worshiping, you're so, so self-focused, thinking about your feelings, because worship gives you a good feeling. <laughs> I say, yes, Lord, it gives me a good feeling. He goes, no, that's not the purpose of worship. For worship is a place that you are cut up. You lose self-consciousness of who you are because you are so much in the awe of who he is. Many of you, these three days, have been worshiping God in your heart. Because all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah. This is who he is. And he's believed because your thought starts changing to the truth and to the thought of the spirit. Amen. That's when he says, I'm pleased with you because you're changing the pattern of thinking, believing who he is and not what you have learned through your fleshly life. And that's the whole story of us. It comes to a place of knowing him intimately, experiencing this love. So now let's get uh, to James uh, chapter 1. Um, I had already opened one of those. I don't want to open another one if you want to. Uh, is it there, my son? No. no, it's not there, but okay. <laughs> because I don't like everybody's leaving like half, <laughs> half of it there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Whew. Jesus. Can I share a story with you? Yes, please. I should have shared stories last night when you guys were tired. <laughs> um, I had a Muslim friend at work. He was from Pakistan. And uh, I uh, was, um, um, so we both got hired at the same time. I think he got hired two weeks earlier. So um, when I was going for interview, you know, your mind goes around, or I have to answer all the right questions because I want them to hire me. And the Lord says, what are you doing? I said, Lord, I'm thinking. He said, what are you thinking? I said, I'm thinking about the answers. He goes, okay, so what are those answers? Where are you, Adam? This is what he was doing to me. Why are you hiding yourself behind some stuff? Uh, yeah. I said, Lord, I'm just, uh, they're going to ask me, what is your passion? What is your answer? Uh, well, I can't say my passion is Jesus Christ. And so I was like in this conflict of, okay, I need a job, but I can't go and say, I want to preach the gospel. So he's going to tell me, what the heck you're doing here then? So go preach the gospel. So anyways, I went there, and I had this in this conflict. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go speak the truth. So this guy, <clears throat> he was... So this story is not for the Muslim. I, I'm just back for to another story. But the same, almost the same thing happened well, for this story of Muslim, which I'm going to share with you. But when, when I went, this guy said, all right, so that's good. You have experienced this. This is I'm sitting here. Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, I see myself five years going around uh, in the globe, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone. He was like. <laughs> He's like. <clears throat> So he brought his, his notebook a little higher so he can hide behind it. 
He says, all right. Um, so um, what is your passion? I said, well, sir, my passion is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know him and to know that he's an amazing God and he's not mad at them. He goes, next question. Every single question he asked, I answered the truth. Because right before I go in there, I said, you know what? They are not going to provide for me. The Lord is my provider. The Lord is my sheep. And he will provide for me. On the way, the thought came and said, you know, you want to go preach the gospel in that company. And if you do, without, um, you need to get your foot in the company. If you talk about Jesus in an interview, they're not going to hire you. And I'm like, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and answering something who I am not and get my foot in the company. And when I talk about Jesus, they told me, how come you are changed now? Yeah. 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 So, so I came back from, I came to Masood, I'm laughing. I said, Masood, well, how, how was it? I was like, that was awesome. He's not going to hire me. <laughs> It was a time, it was a time Masood didn't, Masood had just graduated from his school and we didn't have money and I, we just needed the money. And um, so he called me and he said, okay, when can, when can you start? And he gave me the job. I got the job and guess what happened? Every day I talked about Jesus. I had Jesus as my screensaver on my computer and this Jew walked and he's like, are you a Christian? I was like, yeah, you're a Jew, right? And he said, yes. I said, sir, I am so pleased to meet you, sir. And he said, okay. I said, I have to apologize to you. I was a Muslim. And so he was the big boss. Everyone was under him. Big, big guy. Yeah. So I said, I, I was a Muslim, and all my life I hated Jews because I didn't know the salvation is from the Jews. And today I am a Gentile, and I can be saved because Jesus Christ is a Jew, and he came and he saved me. Thank you so much that your nation followed the promise of Abraham. And Abraham listened to the voice of God, so today I can be saved. He's like, I'm sorry, i got to go to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Those are true stories. <laughs> I want to <laughs> I was in that company for three months because Masood found a job in Calgary and we had to leave to different, we were in Toronto at the time and we had to leave to Calgary. And I was only less than, less than one year Christian at the time. So, uh, I, so one day, so I'm walking around, hey, what's wrong with your stomach? What's wrong with your knee? And I'm praying for people. So... <laughs> And they are freaking out. Who are you? How do you know all these things? And uh, so I went to the back. I went to the warehouse because I had an order and I had to pack up the order. So so I went to the warehouse and this and uh, in the corner of my eye I saw this guy is like oh, walking and I was like I didn't see that <laughs> because that sounds too much for me. <laughs> That pain is a lot for me. I didn't see it. So I was like, oh man, no, I gotta go. So I went to him and I said, what, are you okay? He's like, no, I just have this pain in my belly every morning. Oh, can't walk. I said, okay, can I pray for you? He's like, whatever, if that's gonna help, just do it. I'm like, I believe it, it gives, it, it can. So I grabbed his hand. I said, can I grab your hand? Yeah, okay. So I, I said, okay, in the name of Jesus, pain, leave. I said, okay, I told him, check. He goes, no, it's still the same. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sure it's going to be okay. Maybe tomorrow morning. And I was like, oh. So I walked away, and he's like, thank you for prayer. I'm like, yeah, may the Lord bless you, you know. <laughs> this is not how the Son of God acts, by the way. <laughs> so... I go, so I'm, I'm turning, I turn, and all of a sudden I go, no, why do I need, why do I think tomorrow morning, now, the moment I turn, like, this is literally, this is what happened, I turn to tell him, can I pray, pray for you again, the moment I turn, he goes, what happened, 
He was, something hit him and the pain left. I didn't even need to pray the second time. All I need to know and remember who I was. Yeah. I really was the son of God. So, so, he, uh, so he started talking to me. His wife came to me and he says, uh, why are you doing these things? And why, why did you heal my husband? And I'm like... <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. God, God, won, God wanted to heal him. She's like, you don't understand. We hate the church. We hate Christianity. We don't believe in God. I said, I'm sorry, it's too late. (laughs) Jesus is real. I share the Muslim story later on. So let's go to James chapter 1. So let me tell you this. The guy who hired me, um, I went to his office and I told him, Sir, I feel in my heart that your son has been through an accident. And he had, he went through the major um, back and knee problem. He looked at, he, he was writing, he, he lifted up his eyes, like, I'm going to hire you, you know, like that attitude. He's like, I was a Baptist church pastor. I don't believe in those junks anymore. For 20 years, I was a pastor in the Baptist church. And when I needed God, he didn't show up for me. Ooh. Now, I'm like, less than one year Christian. I'm like, <laughs> you know, what am I going to tell the pastor, the Baptist pastor, who is hurt with God? I said, well, I'm, I understand, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, but if you let me pray for your son, I believe that God will show up. And he says, no, I don't want you to pray for my son. I said, well, it's too late. I'm going ho- to go home and pray. But... Um, <laughs> But I want you to know, but I want you to know that he is, um, he never left you and he loves you. And he's, he looks at me, who, who are you? You're like, you're telling me, yeah. you know, like just became a Christian, all this stuff. And, and I said, I'm so sorry for that, but just let me, let me pray for your son right now here with you. And um, now maybe that waiting that you were waiting to happen, it's now. And he didn't let me to pray. And he said, no, get, please, please, I have things to do. Please leave the office. And he just kind of kicked me out of the office. Uh, and then about a couple of days later, I resigned because we were going to Calgary. I never heard of him after that. I don't know what happened after that. But this is what the, this is what the world can do to us. Yes. Yes. Ah. This is what your experiences can do to you. We need to... Come to a place to realize that I don't believe myself. I don't believe my experiences. I don't believe anything. I believe the word of God. And I will keep repeating and believing until I start seeing the manifestation of this word in me. What are you believing? What are you believing? I, was, I went to the swimming pool, and I went to the jacuzzi, and then I went to sauna. And you know how you usually wait in sauna 10, 15 minutes maximum? Otherwise, you yeah. gone. I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, and this girl, I was about to leave sauna, and I had this girl came into the sauna, and I started talking about Jesus to her, and I forgot that I'm in the sauna. So uh, that, and then I said, hey, something's wrong with your back, and, and she said, yeah, I had surgery a few years ago, and I have all those medals in my back, and I can't bend over. And I said, okay, what do you mean? Like, how can you show me? And he goes, like, listen, this is the maximum I can do because of all those medals in my back. I said, well, it, would you let me to pray for you? She goes, yeah, maybe you should leave the sauna. I said, okay. So when the moment I came out of sauna, maybe I was there like half hour or something. So I came out of the sauna. I felt, um, you know, and I was like, I'm like, 
ignoring this feeling. I said, okay, let me pray for you. And because I wasn't feeling good, I felt I'm passing out. So um, I put my hand in her back and I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And then she and said, okay, can you touch your toe? And she goes, I'll try. So she goes, she went all the way down. She touched her toe and she's freaking out. She said, oh my gosh, I've never, oh my God, how did you do that? And I heard the voice told me, Rose, sit down. Because I was, I was up, I was this, you know, and, um, <clears throat> and so she's, she's like freaking out. And then I, I said, well, that's amazing. Let's go. I took one step and I was gone. I fit, I hit my uh, lips, the teeth to the edge of the bench there. And I don't remember anything. When I was coming back to my body, I was seeing myself speaking. And I was, I was like, okay, that was interesting. I've never had this experience in my life. And I was hearing myself telling them, Jesus is so more in love with you. Oh, don't worry about it. You know what? If you've done anything, Jesus loves you. I was so proud of myself. So, <laughs> so the, the girl had this uh, the, uh, towel on. And she's like, she was like looking at me back healed. And then and she told me, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> you just pray for my back and you passed out. You gave all the energy to me. <laughs> it's funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. And then I was like, okay. So, uh, so uh, I could feel this pain in my like lip here, and you know, like it, there was this feeling. And uh, so after I talked, they gave me a word. Are you okay? Do you want us to call your husband? Where's your husband? And I said, No, I'm okay. I'm just gonna go take a shower. So before I go take a shower, first of all, I immediately checked my teeth with my tongue mm, to make sure I've got all the teeth there. <laughs> and then I go, and then bef- I, I went right in front. Before I look at the mirror, I said, Lord. I don't care what happened to my face because I hit the bench and I refuse to let the mirror speak to me because your word is prophesying over me and is speaking to me. I open my eyes like this to make sure I, I see it a little by a little and I look and I was like completely fine. I was like, okay, good. So, so here's the thing. I went and I took a shower. I was like, nothing happened. Nothing happened, so I'm strong. I came as soon, and I started crying when I came, and I was really overwhelmed with what just happened. So, um, so I, so that was good. I started acting like, acting like I got over it. And uh, the next day, I woke up, and I was in this feeling. I was in fear. I couldn't trust God anymore. I couldn't, like, how can you, if he knew, why did he let me to do? And all those thoughts started coming to me. And what, so look, you're spending how many hours a day studying the Bible? You are this, you are that. So where was he when he showed up? Why didn't he show up for you? You had to be embarrassed in front of everyone. How come he healed that guy and he didn't take care of you who just got smacked on the floor? and all these thoughts are going through my mind and I got home from work I was angry feeling anger I was feeling embarrassed I didn't want to do anything with God I didn't want to read the Bible that was the feeling I had and I remember what all I did is what, like, I, I, I started fighting with this feeling and thoughts because I know God is good. I know all this stuff. This is just an accident, and I can rise up, and, um, and I couldn't get rid of it. Finally, toward the end of the night, I, immediately I came to myself, and I said, why am I entertaining those thoughts? Yeah. Why am I just keep listening and fighting with them? The fight is over. Yeah. I I won the battle. The Lord 
goes before me. So I went to the, I went to the room, I shut the door, and I started saying, Lord, I don't believe in any of those thoughts. That was just the accident. You were with me when I fell down, and you felt the pain. It was not who, who you are that you let me to fall, and you don't. I believe in your word. This is who I am, the son of God. I am in life, and you love me, and inheritance is mine. And I started praying, and before I knew, I'm talking to the Father, and everything was gone. Yeah. And I came back to, um, to where I was before I fell. Yes. And that moment I realized how experiences can really affect us. Yes. And I want to encourage you. I, I want to say, I know it is hard. I know we go through some stuff. Yeah. We lost a good friend of us last year. Thirty-three year old with four kids. And this is not what God wants, and I know that. We were praying. We flew to Arizona to raise him from the dead. The day we got our passport, Canadian passport, we had to expedite our Canadian passport. We grabbed the passport from the office and we flew the same day to Arizona because we wanted to raise him from the dead. But here's the thing. It took me a, long, a month. I couldn't read the Bible. I couldn't pray. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't. I had, I can't, I could not read the book. I couldn't do anything. And it got to a place after a, every, every night you go to bed and, and here's the thing. It, the most important day in Masood and I in our lives is the day that we gave our life to Jesus. February 2nd to 22nd, and he died. Guess what? A few minutes, one, less than one hour after February 2nd, 22nd. Hmm? 20, February 2nd uh, of last year. February 2nd is the day that we gave our life to Jesus. He was sick for a long time. Why would he have to die in the day that is the most important day for me? Do you think something is trying to speak to you? Right? That every year that I want to celebrate that day, he comes to my mind that he's dead? Right? He died 50 minutes after the midnight. And I'm so happy that through that time, um, the Lord was with us. And he, you know, he, experiences are experiences and they are lies. And we have to come to a place to say, you know what, I believe the truth, even though it's not my experience yet. I believe the truth, even though it's not my experience. We got up, we shook ourselves off of the dust of the ground, and we moved on. We lost one, but we can gain many. Yes. Let's move on, and let's move forward, looking unto Jesus, the author of eternal life, the author of salvation. Do you know the voices was going into our mind in that time? What was this? How can you preach life and immortality ever again? Yes. Yes. I don't, we don't preach life and immortality because we are immortal. We preach life and immortality because the word of God says, and it is the only truth, even it, it regard, it, disregarding of my, my experience. Yes. Yes. If, I, if I fall and die tomorrow, that doesn't mean this word is a lie. Amen. Yes. That's when we need to grab him more and we, can, we need to draw closer and say, Lord, show us. How did we miss this? Amen. And one year later, I had this question for one year from the Lord, but he didn't answer me because I wasn't ready for the answer. 
And then he answered me, and now I understand something that I couldn't understand at the time. And there is no condemnation for any of us. We do the best we can, and we trust the God who raises the dead. We don't trust our doctrine. We don't trust our revelation. We trust him who raises the dead. Okay, so let's go to James. Verse 12. Okay. Uh, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Okay, let me just write it down here. says, okay, there is a temptation, but you need to endure the temptation, and if you endure the temptation, the Lord will give you the crown of life, okay? I just wrote down what we just read here, right? Let no one, verse 13, say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, right? Right? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So we've got to quit believing some stuff, right? Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It says, the reason you are tempted, it's because there is a desire in you. And today we want to find, talk about this desire and get it and understand it. Because what I'm sharing this session, if we get it all, we, cannot, we can walk in this path of life. Because Jesus never said, when you come to me, everything is done and everything is good. He said, when you come to me, let me tell you this, you're going to have a lot of problems, but... And we are going to see those problems are the temptation that Jesus was talking about. And if we just want to, if we get what I'm sharing today, it's going to be very, very practical for all of us to start learning this life. Right? We want to see the practical way. We want to see, okay, how are we walking this life? All of us are sitting here. We all get tempted because we all have a desire and we want to see what is this desire and this desire that is in our heart it's not a bad desire necessarily we are going to see it shortly all right so it says then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown bring forth death it says you know what there is a desire temptation come and the conception happens do you see the woman there yes i do the conception happens and then this conception gives birth to a baby this baby is called sin and when this baby is grown and mature and becomes a son it's called death yes death simply is the mature sin and Sin simply is death in a baby form. It says, you know what? You've got a desire here. Um, 
And verse 12 said, when the temptation come, if you endure, you have the crown of life. But right after that, it says, but when the temptation comes, if that conception happens, give birth to sin, and sin Do you see life, death? Choose. Okay. That means in every single temptation, choose life. How do you choose life? We are going to see it today. So do you see there is a desire? And then it says the temptation comes, but blessed is the one who endures the temptation. But if you don't endure the temptation, then you give birth to sin, and sin, when it's, the sin is grown up, it becomes death. That means temptation is the sperm of death. Okay, so let's take a look at it as man and woman. There is a desire in you, and temptation comes. and bring that conception. So temptation is simply death in a form of a seed. Baby death. Do you see there is a growth of death from, from a conception to maturity? Right? So now, here, um, <clears throat> verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of ter turning. So he says, okay, so... But the gift is the gift of life. And he is, don't we read that in Hebrews chapter 11, that the, the, the one who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. So Hebrews chapter 11, it, has, it should translate like this. Those who come to God, they must believe that he is, and he is the reward of those who diligently seek him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the gift then? He himself is the reward because you are diligently seeking him, and that means you are enduring the time of temptation. That means the moment this, the, the temptation comes to you to conceive a desire that is in you, you don't go to be a harlot and go conceive through another, but you stay virgin because you know that through the man, your husband, that conception can happen only. Yes. And that's when that life starts bursting out of you. Yes. So, so now uh, let's go to... Um, let's go to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> because all of us have this question. If this is good, all this good stuff is written in the Bible, how can I have this? How can I live it? How is it that it's... I'm not seeing it. And today we want to just talk a little about it. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will open up our heart so all of us, even me standing here, so we can grasp this and understanding this depth of truth so we can walk in it. All right. So... Revelation chapter 2. So Jesus is writing to this church. And we, we need to understand, we, the lampstand, there was a lampstand here yesterday. Oh. Is it heavy? No. Okay. 
there is, a, there, is a one, there is one lampstand with seven branches, okay? But in the book of Revelation, we see seven lampstands. That means they are separated from each other. Yes. At the end of the day, these seven are one. Because we weren't supposed to have seven lampstand, but we are supposed to have one lampstand because we have one head. Yes. Yes. In the book of Revelation, the reason we have seven lampstand is because the church is in Babylon, and Babylon is sitting on a beast with seven head. So Jesus is coming in the midst of the lampstand to turn the lampstand on, provide the, the, the oil, and make seven one. Yes. Okay. So these seven lampstands, they are, they are not seven different peoples, and they are not seven different churches. They are you, with the seven different revelation of Jesus. Because the seven spirit of God gives you the seven revelation of Jesus. And that means it's the completion of knowing who he is. It's seven is the number of rest. It's the number that God is rested. So he provides that perfect revelation that you need so that you can have this um, reigning in life that the book of Revelation is talking about. So he's writing to one of the churches. And every single one of those churches is us. I can be any of them, time to time, or at the same time, until all the lights are on and I have the fullness. I can see the, I can see clearly in the fullness of this light. So Jesus is talking to this church in Smyrna, <clears throat> and verse eight, Revelation chapter two, verse eight. And to the angel of the church in a Smyrna right. I just want to have a little a correction here. Who is the angel? Messenger. Who is the messenger? The one who has a message. So you don't give a message to messenger. So wait a second. Don't, let's go step by step. So you don't give a message to messenger. You give a message by a messenger. So the translation should be an, by the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? They are not the pastors of the church. They are not the da da da. Simply messengers, because in the in verse one is talking about those who are witnessing to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have a revelation of Jesus Christ is simply in one word. I don't have time to bring the teaching for you. Your spirit is your priest and is the messenger into the temple of your yeah. body. Yeah. Yes. So he is speaking to your spirit to give a message to the soul, the church, so that you can overcome something. So now he's talking. That's why end of every single letter, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says. So the angel is your spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit that is one with your spirit and he's revealing Jesus Christ to you. That's why hear what the spirit says. And then Jesus introduces himself in the beginning of every church. He says, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Verse 9, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a, are a synagogue of Satan. So do you see tribulation? Synagogue of Satan? Keep that in mind. Verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. The word tested is tempted. It's the same word that we read in James about temptation. It says the devil is about to tempt some of you and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Okay, so let's take a look here. It says the devil is about to tempt you, temptation. 
Be faithful and I give you the crown of life. But we read in James that it says those who endure have the crown of life. It says, but what, is, what does Jesus say? It says, be faithful and then I give you the crown of life. So what am I going to do here? So this can, have, can come to two different steps here. And then I give you the crown of life. But it says, be faithful to... Be faithful to... Oh, okay. You, can, you guys can see it? No. Oh, okay. You know what? Let's do this. Is green okay? Better? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so it says the devil is about to tempt you, but be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Who he has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 11. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Okay, do you see two deaths here? Yes. One. Two. Be faithful until death. That doesn't mean until right before death. It actually says to death. It says when the temptation comes, you are faithful and you walk through the death and then you come out of the death. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your soul, you will lose it. But if you want to lose your soul for my sake, you will lift it up into eternal life. So when the temptation comes, your soul comes to the picture. Why? Because this desire is in your soul. And when does this desire come? When? Let's take a look at the positive desire. The desire that is the lust of the world and all the stuff. We don't want to talk about it today. We don't have those things. But we have the desire that comes to us when God speaks to us and he gives us a promise. So the moment that God speaks to you, there is a desire that starts, that comes into your soul. So that this promise that God gave you wants to become fulfilled and you have that desire. God says, this is the promise I want to give you, eternal life. And all of a sudden there is a desire inside of you, but it says, okay, the moment the temptation comes to you, and what does the temptation say? It comes to the soul. Because it says, did God really say? You know, why don't you do this so that you can fulfill the promise? You know, Abraham, God gave you this promise. Oh, you know, maybe God meant go to Hagar. And then you produce something out of the flesh that brings death and not the life. So he who endures and is faithful, that means he's the one who goes through death because it is the death of the soul happens on the cross. Cross, okay, let me tell you, the only way to get rid of temptation is to die. The only way you can get rid of temptation is to die. Well, but what are you dying in? Desire. Let me tell you this. <laughs> Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for the Lord will give, the Lord 
who gave the promise when you endure temptation the Lord will give you the crown of life because you love the Lord and not the promise oh come on if you love the promise you go to Hagar Because when the Lord give you a promise, the promise of eternal life doesn't become your God. The Lord is your God and you will faithful and you remain faithful until he will give you the crown of life. You know what the problem is? The problem is what God says becomes more important than God himself. The word of God becomes more important than God himself. Oh, what Masood says become more important to me than who he really is and that's when you have conceived with another Jesus, Jesus. That's so, good. Wow. Wow. so here's the thing if I want a kid and Masood, my husband, doesn't want kid. And kid is more, having a child is more important than Masood for me. Guess what happens? Right? I want, the promise becomes more important. So now P Paul writes to Titus. <laughs> I got to read this for you. You guys want to go there? Yes. Go to Titus. Titus chapter 1. What a man of God, Paul. And I just want to say, thank God for people that they dare to believe the truth. Thank God for Pastor Wynn that dare to believe the truth. Thank God for you that you dare to believe the truth because someone will eat of life in you. Thank God for Paul who dared to believe the truth, who left behind everything he had to follow Jesus. Thank God for people over the ages that in the midst of all persecution, when they were stoned, they were spit on, they were called Satan, but they did not give up believing the truth. Blessed be those that they didn't let their experiences become their God. Verse 1, Titus, Paul a bond servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according, ooh. wow, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In the hope of eternal life, when God promised us, but he cannot lie. That's why I'm speaking to the faithful elect, because you are enduring the temptation. You refuse to believe another voice, and you believe what the Lord promised you. In the hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. <laughs> the promise of God is being manifested through preaching. 
Because when God gives a promise, he sends a word and you hear the word and that word of God becomes a desire inside of you. To conceive. Do you see the woman? Do you see two women here? Do you see there is a woman that gives birth to death? And do you see there is a woman that gives birth to life? If there is death, that if temptation conceived, give birth to sin and brought death, but when the temptation comes and you endure, it's like the word you heard is like the word you heard conceives with the spirit and gives life. So Mary, blessed. Mary, you are blessed. You are blessed because, you want to go read it? Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Oh, ho, ho, this is good. Amen. So when God speaks, the promise that he gives is so good. We want to have it. But because we don't have patience and endurance, we go make it happen. And before we know, the promise of God became more important than the one who gave the promise. And that's where the temptation comes. Did God really say, do not eat from any tree in the garden? The focus was never about eating or not eating. The focus is about the God who loved you so much that he didn't want you to die. And the temptation came and brought the focus off of God and on eating and drinking. Off of God and being, being God. Off of God and being wise. Off of God and the promise. Temptation will never come if God doesn't speak. Because it doesn't have anything to go against. But what does God want to give you? He wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to produce himself in you. Be fruitful and multiply. How? Hear my word. Let my word conceive in you. And let me produce myself in you. This is how you can subdue the earth. This is how you can be fruitful and multiply. When he is fruitful and multiply in you. not Not the seed of Satan. The serpent but the seed of the living God. Look at verse, uh, Matthew verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follow. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they come together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. The true translation is, she was found in the belly to have of the Holy Spirit. This is the right translation. She was found in the belly to have. Of the Holy Spirit. Uh. Wow. Do you remember Jesus said, out of your belly yes. flows? Because what is in your belly is of, and the Holy Spirit is the fountain of life. So, She was found in the belly to have of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Let's move to verse 21. The angel appears to Joseph because Joseph wanted secretly to divorce her. 
to him, she's a harlot. Come on, guys. Yeah. Jewish culture, Middle East, yeah. 14, 16 years old. Who's going to believe you to say, I'm pregnant with God? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody going to believe you. You did something. You did, Like, what do you mean? They, they, were, they were going to, to stone her if they would have realized she's pregnant. So now Joseph doesn't want that to happen to her. He wants to secretly divorce her and bring some kind of excuse that the public doesn't know what happened. No one knew what happened after, until after the resurrection of Jesus. They would have stoned her to death. Verse 21. And she will bring forth a son... And you shall call his name Jesus, Savior, or salvation. For he will save his people from their sin. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, is the same word. The virgin shall in the belly, shall in the belly to have to have and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us, or better translation is God in us. So there was a prophecy in the Old Testament, and it got fulfilled. Now, what are we talking here? We are talking about the reincarnation of God in you. We are talking about him. If he came once and that happened, so now this is the story of us in the spirit with him, and he can come inside of us, be a son inside of us, and now this time doesn't come out as the second person. He becomes us. Uh, yes. Yes. He starts manifesting himself in us. So now Mary, is it in Luke? Thank you. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. <coughs> of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at, her, at this saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And, we, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said, do you really think Mary understood all those things that the angel said? <laughs> Do you really think that um, when we read the Bible, we understand everything? I, no. But we can still believe. We don't have to understand to believe. Our mind doesn't need to not understand all those things until we believe. Mary had a simple question. And the end, uh, so Mary said, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Yes. How can this happen? The 
and what did Ange let me see, let's read it and then I'll talk. Now, look at verse 38. Then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Do you know what happened? The angel came and says, this is going to happen. And Mary says, okay, how is this going to happen? Because I don't know a man. And the angel says, the power of the Most High, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And there is the holy thing will be conceived in you. And that will be called the Son of God. And Mary said, I don't understand the word you said. <laughs> I have no under I don't know what you're talking about but let it be to me according to the word of the Lord yes. so what happened the word came the spirit came and Mary said I will keep what the word and the spirit in me and that conception happened the conception of Jesus in Mary had nothing to do with humanity Mary had no part to play in the conception. Yeah. There was the word and the spirit. The word became flesh. Yes. <laughs> Mary had no part in conceiving. Mary just believed. Yes. She was she was the womb, basically, to hold what? The word, the spirit. The word and the spirit. The word and the spirit and gave birth to a baby. Yeah. But when this baby was matured, was called the son of God, and he became the savior of the woman. Yes. 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 Let's go to chapter... Let's go to chapter 2. Verse, um, verse 33. Luke, chapter 2, verse 33. You know, let's read a couple of verses before that. It's so good. I just want to read those. Look at verse, uh, look at from verse 30. This is this prophet Simon is talking. I guess he was a prophet. So he says, verse 30, for my eyes, that's when he sees Jesus, the baby. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Do you see? The birth of Jesus was a sign. What is a sign? The sign says, don't look at me. Look at where, look at where I'm pointing at. Yes, yes. Don't look at the birth that I had in the flesh. Look at the sign that I'm showing you because that was the sign to show you that if this is going to happen in you. When the word of God comes to you and the spirit comes and you say, I am the faithful one. I believe, Lord, let it be done according to your word. And then you conceive the son of God inside of you. Yes. So the birth and everything that happened in the flesh, it was only a sign for something greater for us. Verse 35, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. <laughs> so who is the woman? The soul. The soul hears the word and has a desire. The husband come, the spirit. And conception of the word and the spirit happens in the soul. And out of this oneness of spirit and word together inside of soul, there is this holy thing will be conceived. Yes. 
This holy thing is called the Son of God, and it will bring a sword, the Word of God, to divide the soul from a spirit, to, to reveal the thoughts of the soul that are not godly, to bring to you the thoughts of the spirit, because the thoughts of the spirit are life. Yes. We just read it. Yes. The thoughts of the soul are death. Yes. So when the Son of God is birthed in you, it's going to help you to, for salvation. So we need to give birth. Yep, that's right. mm -hmm. Let's go to John chapter 16. So when people are following the Lamb, where are they going? Why are they following the Lamb? Okay, so this is a test now, okay? I want to see you guys learned your <laughs> lesson in the last three days. So when are you, when you're following the lamb, you're following to the cross. But why are you following the lamb? Because you've got a temptation. So, but you're following the lamb because you're going to give birth to a lion. Well said. <laughs> You are going to give birth because the death of Jesus on the cross was the birthplace of the Christ, yes. the Son of God. So when you follow the Lamb, you are going to give birth. Mm. That's why you are going to go to this agony. What agony? We are going to see verse, the chapter 16 of John. Oh. 20 minutes. I can do this, huh? Yes. All right. So look at verse 20. Jesus is talking about his coming here. So we've been talking about a lot about the coming of Jesus. <laughs> here he's talking about the same thing. In verse 20, most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will, t will be turned into joy. So imagine Jesus comes, you're going to cry, you're going to shout, you're going to be sorrowful, you're like, oh my gosh, but... But your sorrow will, sorrow will turn to joy. A woman, verse 21, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow. Do you see? It's the sorrow that is talking about is the sorrow of giving birth. The word labor is actually the same word as giving birth that Mary told, that angel told Mary. Told Mary. So it says, okay, when you, are, when you are in a place of giving birth, you are in the sorrow. Because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. The word anguish is the tribulation. The same word that Jesus talks in Revelation chapter 2. I know that you are in tribulation. You are in temptation. So no longer remembers the anguish for joy that for a human being, or better word, the right translation is a child, has been born into the world. Verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. Hold on. <laughs> you have a sorrow because you are giving birth to a child. You have a sorrow, you're not going to see me. You have a sorrow, but you're going to give a birth to a child. But don't worry, I'll see you. <laughs> you guys don't get it. You have a sorrow because you're not going to see me because I'll be a baby inside of you. But the moment you go through the birth and you give birth to a child, that child is me and I'll see you. Yes. The reason you're not going to see me, because you are giving birth. <laughs> but the moment you went through the labor and gave birth, then we'll see each other face to face. Because I am that baby you just gave birth to. Yeah. 
And that baby is the one who's going to give the crown of life to you because the baby is not going to stay baby forever. The baby is going to be the full mature son of God, the one who will bring the sword to pierce even in your soul and bring the salvation to you. So it says, okay, those times when a woman is in birth, it is called the time of tribulation. Everybody is waiting for tribulation in the book of Revelation. <laughs> oh, is it, is it chapter 12? Is it when? Is it 2020? The tribulation is the time that you endure temptation. When you have the word of God, you hang on to the word of God. You don't go to another Jesus. You remain there. You go through the pain of the cross because you are giving birth to the Christ, the Son of God. You don't save your soul. You let your soul to open up itself to the Spirit to bring something that is in the soul, and that is called the Son of God. Amen. You get to a place that you don't love yourself to the soul, but you love the one who gave you the promise. Yes. Yes. Not the promise, the one who gave the promise to you. So Jesus says, you're not going to see me because I am being conceived in you. It's like in a seed inside of you. But the moment you give birth, you forget all the sorrows because you'll see me again. Amen. You'll see me again. So let's quickly go to the book of Revelation. I'm just wrapping up in five, ten minutes here. <clears throat> Chapter 7. Are you guys hung are you guys hungry? Who told you you're hungry? <laughs> That's right. I put the right word. Well, that's the first thing God said after God spoke first time. He speaks, and then he says, who told you? I just, I didn't say that. I said something else. That's the story. I gave you a sentence you can repeat every day. And that's God speaking to you. Amen. <laughs> so you guys are not tired, right? <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 7. Look at verse um, 4. Do, do, do. We can start. Maybe we should go all the way back to chapter 1. But we can start from verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, and answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where, where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he's seeing some people that they are arrayed in white clothes, right? Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribula tribulation. Oh, wow. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He who sits on the throne will dwell with them. They shall neither hunger any longer anymore nor thirst anymore. Who told you you're hungry and thirsty? Yeah. <laughs> the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the lamb who... Do you see the lamb? Yeah. What happened? Who are those people who came out of the tribulation? They are the one what? They endured the temptation. They gave birth some, to the son of God. That's why they are following the lamb, because they want to give birth. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. 
Why? Because the lamb is just, the son of God is being born out of them. That's why they're going to have living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every, every tear from their eyes. So here's the thing. So I don't have time here to go to the conscience here, but to the, um, to the rope here. <laughs> the rope is the conscience. So, um, which probably, I think Masood was going to talk about that uh, today, which is going to be powerful. That your conscience is actually your rope, that you keep it clean by the blood of the Lamb. The only place that the blood is keeping you clean, it's in your conscience. But it's, what is it saying? So let's go quickly to Revelation chapter 14. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was going to cover the second this. But let me say, say this, and we talk about that. All right, so let's go to Revelation chapter 14, and we see the same people. Verse 4. These are the ones... Same people, white robes, all the stuff, following the lamb. I don't have time to read all the scriptures, but let's read verse 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with? Women. All right, that's a wrong word. It has to be woman. Which woman? The woman that gives birth to? Sin, the woman that gives birth to death. Jesus is writing to one of the churches, and this is the only place that you see Jesus is saying, do not let the woman to speak in the church. That's the only time, and that's the woman called Jezebel. Jezebel means married to Baal. Jezebel means, the, the, Jezebel was the queen of Israel. She was married to the king of Israel, but her name is, I'm not married to you, I'm married to my god Baal. And now she's producing kids and children in the church, and Jesus is writing and says, I'm coming and I will kill her children. Why are you allowing this woman to speak in the church? When Paul is writing in, in the letters and says, I don't allow the woman to speak, which woman is she talking about? That's the only place that you see that Jesus is talking about. The soul of man that is under the oppression of the temptation that wants to fulfill the promises of God through its own work is the Jezebel. It's where you bring a doctrine that is not of Christ. You create a God out of your own imagination, out of your misunderstanding of who he is. And then what happens is you start giving birth to death. And death becomes your child. Then you are a mother that gives birth to death. And guess what? That son is going to rise up and kill you. But if we give birth to the son, to the son of God, that son will save the mother. So now, here Jesus says, I don't allow this woman to talk in the church. So it's not talking about me. Because I have the spirit of the living God in me. And if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through me too. So please listen to the voice of God. And don't judge according to the flesh. Right? And I want to say here, if you are a woman and you have a message from God. Probably message you should say that, but I say it. If you, are, <laughs> if you are a woman and you have a message from God, just rise up. Rise up. I came from a culture that women had no right to speak. All my life, I could not speak. All my life in my culture that I was grown up, every time I, I came to speak, my father told, shushed me. And even right, even when I started having revelations and I started talking, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, to a friend of us, a Christian, and I remember one day she told me, be quiet, let your husband talk. I was less than a year Christian. I went to the room and I cried. Because all my life I was oppressed as a woman. 
And now the Lord spoke to me and said, there is no man, there is no woman in Christ. We are all one body, Christ Jesus. There is no black and white. There is no male and female. There is no Jews and Greek. There is no Gentiles. And the Lord spoke to me that day and he said, I am making you a teacher and a preacher of the gospel. So you better rise up and don't see yourself the way people see you. See yourself the way God sees you. Don't let what people see and define you become your identity. I was at work and, and, and all the women are working. I'm speaking to women now, men. Can you please close your eyes and ears, please, for a minute? I'm at work, and I realize women, they, their problem is not men. They, they are their own problem. They are the ones that they see themselves lower than the others. At work, all the men were acting to me exactly the same they would act to each other. And I had a, I had a um, co-worker, Kimmy, she was so angry at me. And I said, why are you angry? She said, how come they come to my desk and they pull out all their stuff on me, but they, they don't do that to you? I said, well, because you see yourself lower than them. The way, the way you see yourself, you show yourself, and they'll act to you. And start seeing yourself. I don't see myself lower than men. I see them as my brothers. Yes. And that's, that causes them, that causes them. Listen, we, had, we have, uh, in, in a Persian community, they don't accept women as a preacher and teacher. And what happened is, we are sitting, Masood and I, both of us are teachers, and we are sitting, and they all go, Masood, we have a question. And I'm sitting there too. <laughs> I had to rise up and realize that I don't care. And sometimes when they ask Masood, I answered. <laughs> right? Masood, they ask Masood, and I would go, oh, can I answer that question? And everybody's like, okay, and turn back and look at me. And I realized that those who ask questions from Masood are not men. They are the women. Yes. All right, women. <laughs> so now we realize that we all are women. Yes, yes. yes. we are all women. Yes. And we are all sons of God. If you are a woman, you have a message, and God has given you, get up, you're in America at least. <laughs> I come from different culture. I wasn't allowed to talk. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. It got, it got to a point that when people, it got to a point when people ask Masood a question, oh Masood, Masood started saying, Rose, do you have anything to say? <laughs> and then things started breaking out. It hasn't been completed yet, but we are working on it. <laughs> Okay, so, so it says these women are, uh, where are we in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4? These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb, whoever He goes. These are redeemed from among men, being first fruit to God and to the Lamb. <laughs> so we... We know that, right? So now I want to just talk a little about this, the second death. So everybody's paying attention and I'm wrapping up here. So I want to talk about the second death. Jesus said, if you have a desire, endure the temptation, and then I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful until death, and I give you the crown of life. So this is the first death, and then we have the first resurrection. To all. And, but if you don't endure and overcome, this is called overcoming. Do you see? All you need to do, you need to overcome the temptation. 
not death, the temptation. Not death. We don't overcome death, the giant. <laughs> temptation. Kill this thing here as long as it's in the form of a thought. As long as this thing is a little thing, a seed, kill it so you don't have to lay there on or fruit the tree. Yeah. 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 Jesus said, but if you, that happened and that, I'll, I'll uproot it for you. I'll raise you from the dead. Don't worry. But it's about overcoming. And he said, if that doesn't happen, then you shall be hurt by the second death. Do you know, let me tell you what this means. Jesus comes, for example, if you, if he, if you are supposed to be built up something according to the blueprint of an architecture, ar architect, and then the architect comes and says, you didn't follow the blueprint, it says, destroy this thing and build it again. Jesus says, okay, you know what? I am the one who has eyes like a flame of fire. I search things, and if you have produced kids there, I'm going to come and kill those because you're supposed to overcome, and that's going to really hurt. Yes. Why? Because you produced Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. Ishmael is your baby, yes. but that's not the child of the promise. It means you're... God wants you to move on. And if you're not moving on, and he keeps coming and saying that you're stuck and you're building things with the straw and not the gold, he destroys them and says, this is not who you are built with the gold. This is not who you are. He keeps coming and destroying this. And this is the, the kids that we are producing here in the flesh. And he keeps coming. And what does he do? He removes Everything that is holding us back. But we are not supposed to produce death as the church. We are supposed to move on and be the overcomer. Yes, yes, yes. But if you are still coward, unbelieving, let's go to the end of the chapter. Chapter 21. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Do you see? He told the church, if you overcome, you shall, I shall give you the crown of life. Here it says, if you overcome, you, have, you will inherit all things. And I will be, I will be the, his God and he shall be my son. Verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderer, sexually immoral, Sorcerers, idol idolaters, da da da, they shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it's the lake of fire that purifies. It's a lake of fire that purifies the gold. It's the lake of fire that removes the cowardly and unbelieving. Who was the coward and unbelief? Adam. But here's the thing. You're not supposed to keep being purified, never be built, and never overcome. It's like a land that you clean the land from all the thorns and thistles and weeds and everything, but you never plant a seed. And then you go and you come back and you again, the land is filled and he comes and he cleanses, but you never plant seeds to bear fruit and have the harvest. This is what the, the second death is. He brings the fire, destroys everything, but now don't let things come back again. It's time for overcoming. That's why in chapter 20, blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection, for they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. 
It's not about keep cleaning you. It's about you learning to produce the land you have. And as you are producing and having the seeds and uh, harvesting, you take care of the land. You remove all the stuff that doesn't have to be there. So you don't want to be the barren land. He bring the fire to clean you. But how long do you want to do you want to be kept cleaning, cleansing yourself? There is a place we got to rise up and say, "Okay, I'm ready. I believe. I believe." Right? And even we see that in the end of chapter 20, death falls into the lake of fire. And Hebrews said that our God is a consuming fire. The eyes of Jesus is the flame of fire because the lake of fire is inside of his heart and you can see the flames through his eyes. Because his heart is burning with love and compassion for the church. When he comes, he devours everything that has to be devoured so you can overcome. He says, he says, I am not supposed to keep coming to you and correcting you. Let's, let's get up and be mature. I'm not supposed to keep cleaning you. You are clean. Get up. Let's overcome. Let's inherit all things. Let us move on to perfection. All right, would you stand, please? And I want all of us to shout, we believe. We believe. 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 Who told me I don't believe? (laughs) Right? Say it. I I believe. I believe. The one who gave the promise is more important than the promise. I am faithful. I am washed clean by the blood. I am, my robe is clean. I move on to perfection. I put aside the old. I follow the new. I follow the Lamb of God. I endure through tribulation. When a temptation comes, I don't go to another. I love my husband. I love my bridegroom. I love the Spirit. I stay in the promise of God until His seed is planted in me. I love Him. I love the Lord who gave the promise. I am not going to go to Hagar. I produce the child of the promise. I produce the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe and I will overcome. When I am weak, I am strong. So that the Lord may be magnified. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father.